From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Washington Watch. Coming up after 22 days without a Speaker of the House, earlier today, House Republicans unanimously elected Mike Johnson as the 56th Speaker of the House of Representatives. The total number of votes cast is 429, of which the Honorable Mike Johnson of the state of Louisiana has re received 220 votes. Therefore, the Honorable Mike Johnson of the state of Louisiana, having received a majority of the votes cast, is duly elected Speaker of the House of Representatives for the 118th Congress. That was acting Speaker Patrick McHenry of North Carolina. While many are not familiar with Mike as he emerged as the one candidate that could unite Republicans, the Washington Watch audience, well, they know him well. He's a frequent guest on here. This is a new day for Congress and I would argue the country. And we're going to talk about uh, why with another Louisiana colleague, the House Majority Leader, Steve Scalise, in just a moment. One of the first orders of business for the now functioning House was a resolution of support for Israel. And it could not have come at a more critical moment as the heart of the United Nations was revealed yesterday by this statement from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. The attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence. Their economy stifled, their people displaced and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to their plight have been vanishing. We're going to get reactions to that from Chris Smith, co-chair of the Israel Allies Caucus, and Florida Congressman Mike Walt, both members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, a little later here on Washington Watch. Also, freelance uh, war correspondent Chuck Holton will have a live update for us from Israel a little later in the program. Our word for today comes from Chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not looking back, Paul says, but forward, lest I stumble in this race of life. You know, our lives can sometimes become stained with sin, marked with mistakes, but once those are covered under the blood of Jesus, we're not to look back. We're to press on to those things which are ahead, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, the crown of life. For more on our Bible reading plan, go to TonyPerkins.com, where you can join us each day for a daily devotion. Well, speaking of pressing forward, I want to thank the thousands of folks that responded to our call for prayer over the last few weeks for Congress and the election of a speaker. Those prayers have been answered, and uh, we're thankful. Well, this morning I spoke with uh, Congressman Mike Johnson and told him we would ask people to pray for the next 21 days for him and for the Congress, because it's going to be critical in correcting the course of this Congress. And so I ask you, will you join me in praying? We have a 21-day prayer guide available. To join us, simply text the word SPEAKER to 67742. That's the word SPEAKER to 67742. You take the prayer pledge, you'll get the prayer points, and we'll let Speaker Johnson know that you are praying for him in the House of Representatives as we move forward. I right, just got word that they are voting on the House floor right now, so Congressman Scalise is going to be a little late getting to us. I'm going to go to Brent Kylan. Uh, FRC Action, and uh, he's also our Vice President for St Strategic Initiatives here at the Family Research Council. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the landscape looks like going forward into 2024. Now, obviously, this puts the Republicans on better footing. I think you're going to see some, some very strong things coming out of this Congress with some very principled, God-directed leadership. It's going to make a big difference, but we've got some other things to look at. Brent, Welcome back. Tell us what those other things we're looking at are. 
Well, Tony, the uh, the landscape is uh, is an interesting one to watch when we look at the uh, the House majority. So we we have the new speaker, but but the current GOP majority is a slim one. Um, and our viewers and, and listeners will remember uh, the the current House GOP majority is the only thing that's standing in the way of a of a Democrat trifecta. They have the Senate and they and they have the House um, or excuse me the presidency. So that makes the the House that much more important. Important. And um, the current GOP can only afford to lose about five votes uh, in order to pass anything through. And so uh, very, very important. It makes every seat uh, that much more important. And so we're, what we're watching now particularly is the redistricting. Um, this, this happens every 10 years, so it happened back in 2020, but uh, there have been a number of court cases that are still working their way through the, the court system. There's about uh, 10 to 12 states where this is happening. Um, it's estimated this could potentially affect anywhere between uh, 14 to 18 House seats, and um, that could that could sway the majority. Uh, one way or the other, the, the, the big states that we're watching are New York, where it's possible that Democrats could actually pick up uh, up to six more seats, depending on how the, the process plays out there. And then uh, North Carolina on the other side, uh, there have been some court rulings there where they're uh, redrawing some lines could potentially uh, pick up up to four um, GOP, additional GOP House seats. And then the other the other states have one or two potentially in play. Um, so, Tony, it just makes, again, every seat that much more uh, important in, in the majority going into 2024 uh, is really anything but certain at this point. Yeah, and I think we, we saw in the last election, the midterm election, you know, there was this anticipation or this projection of a of a red wave. But what we found over the last now we've gone through literally 20 years of redistricting based upon a more conservative uh, census. And, and, of course, that's what's being challenged in court uh, because we saw in 2010, we saw states move red and electing Republicans. They redrew the lines. And so we've had, uh, you know, very conservative districts. There's just not a lot of middle ground anymore. So now it's being fought out in the courts. And that's, you know, one or two seats one way, as we're seeing now with this current Congress, can make the difference. Tony, that's exactly right. Yeah, and in looking at the way those lines got redrawn, um, as you pointed out, we do not have as many swing districts. So, so on the one hand, that means a majority for one party or the other could be um, a bit more solid because even if the the, the number isn't as high, um, that they're they're likely to retain it. But that also makes these these seats in the middle that much more important because uh, there are still swing seats. They're just are not as many of them as we right. typically have seen historically when well, watching this sort of thing. I, I, I want to go to uh, what took place today in, in the House. Uh, it looks like uh, Steve Scalise is going to be tied up on, on the House floor. We may get him later in the program, but this is the, this is the challenge of doing a program live uh, in the afternoon when uh, the House is in session. So I, so I want to go to some of the, the comments from uh, now Speaker Mike Johnson uh, on the floor and the tone that he set, and this is why I'm, I'm very optimistic that this is this is a first. He, he Mike is a different type of, of leader, and I think this is going to give the Republicans an advantage because he's casting a vision. I want to play uh, clip number eight, please. I want to tell all my colleagues here what I told the Republicans in that room last night. I don't believe there are any coincidences in a matter like this. I, I believe that Scripture, the Bible, is <clears throat> very clear that, that God is the one that raises up those in authority. He raised up each of you, all of us. And, and I believe that God has ordained and allowed each one of us to be brought here for this specific moment in this time. This is my belief. I believe that each one of us has a huge responsibility today to use the gifts that God has given us to serve the extraordinary people of this great country, and they deserve it and to ensure that our republic remains standing as the great beacon of light and hope and freedom in a world that desperately needs it. That's not a message we've heard from the House floor very often. 
And this is, you know, it was interesting to watch you as he was making that speech. I was on Newsmax earlier talking about it. But social media was blowing up on the left. This was just making their heads explode. But this is this is this is uh, Congressman Mike Johnson. I mean, he is he is a man of deep faith and he is going to lead that way. And that's what in part made him attractive to his colleagues. Tony, it's just so, uh, so encouraging. Uh, this this really is is a breath of, of fresh air. Um, you look at the how key this position is. I mean, this is the person that's that's really going into these meetings, um, as you have pointed out earlier with uh, leaders like Chuck Schumer and, and things like that. And we need somebody who gets that perspective and just how important that is. Uh, so key. And it's it's just really encouraging to, to see somebody who has this in this type of position for the country. I want to play another clip of uh, of his uh, remarks. I think we got time to work this in. Um, talking about this, and this is something he shared with me that uh, he just felt impressed in this process to lay out. This was a, a, about two weeks ago. He felt like the door was going to open for him. And um, anyway, this is uh, something he laid out in terms of core principles that this Congress needs. Uh, clip 10. 10. In his farewell address, President uh, Reagan uh, explained the secret of his rapport with people. And, and I like to paraphrase his explanation all the time. He said, you know, they call me the great communicator, but I really wasn't that. He said, I was just communicating great things. And they're the same great things that they've guided our nation since its founding. What are those great things? I call them the seven core principles of American conservatism, but let me concede to you all, I think it's really quintessentially the core principles of our nation. I boil them down to individual freedom, limited government, the rule of law, peace through strength, fiscal responsibility, free markets, and human dignity. Those, those are the foundations that made us the extraordinary nation that we are. And you and I today are the stewards of those principles. The things that have made us the freest, most powerful, most successful nation in the history of the world. The things that have made us truly exceptional. I mean, again, he's, he's, uh, he was not combative. He was basically, in fact, he was, uh, he was jovial. In fact, it was very interesting watching some of the other reporters report on this. That They said they felt like there was joy in the House chamber. And I said, you know, that, there, there was a sense, uh, as, as I talked to Mike before he uh, made his speech this, uh, this afternoon, uh, there was just a sense of peace and confidence. And I think that came across, and I think it filled... The, the 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 room there and i think republicans now have hope I think uh, this also underscores just how important the call for prayer is that you mentioned at the at the beginning of the the program. We need leaders, good leaders in in this position. This is also a difficult position like we were talking about earlier. You can only afford to lose about five votes in the House to, to, to pass anything. And, and there's a lot of very good members in the House, but there's also some moderate Republicans. Um, there's disagreements, some pretty deep disagreements in the caucus about some things. And so um, this is not an easy job. And uh, I just want to uh, reiterate what you were saying there. This is a great step, but but the, the call for prayer and continuing to hold our leaders up in prayer uh, in positions like this is just going to be so important moving forward. It, it absolutely is. And the uh, it, it's interesting. The attacks are already beginning on him. Uh, Brent Kylan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Tony. Good to be with you. All right, folks, stick around. We've got uh, more Washington Watch still to come. Not exactly sure what we'll have, but we're going to have something. We're still going to be hearing from Israel. Chuck Holton's going to be joining us. And uh, a little bit later, Going to be talking to Mike Waltz of Florida, so don't go away. We're back with more after this.
Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They are disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us. The website, TonyPerkins.com. All right, big news today. We now have a House speaker, and not just any House speaker. We have uh, Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana frequent uh, guest on our program here, a strong believer who's already being criticized by his, for his faith. Um, it, interesting. I, I'm sure there'll be a lot of analysis of that. This is, you know, he kind of emerged uh, as a dark horse as the Republicans could not agree on a candidate. And because of his relationships with so many members, he had unanimous support. This is the first time, I believe, since 2011 that the Republicans have selected a leader unanimously, not a single vote in opposition. That's, that's, over, that's over 10 years uh, since this has happened. And, uh, I mean, it's a testament to, the, to his, uh, just the way he operates. And, and I'm very optimistic of what we're going to see going forward. I'm going to play a couple more clips of uh, his speech today. And, and then I, I, I kind of, I'm not sure where I want to start, because there's such a contrast between um, the House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, who spoke first, if you happen to see this. In fact, let me just do this. I, I, I want to I start with his, uh, his remarks. He spoke first, and this is just a, a short clip of his conclusion. And after he spoke, uh, then he handed the gavel uh, to, to Congressman Mike Johnson, and he spoke. So I'm going to play this clip, clip number 14. Let me conclude with an observation about the state of our democracy. Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election. He's doing a great job under difficult circumstances, and no amount of election denialism will ever change that reality. Not now, not ever. Well, you, you can't tell, but if you're watching, he was... Um pointing to the Republicans. So he was uh, talking to the Republicans, kind of, kind of poking them in the eye. Well, here is the, uh, I, I want to give you the close of uh, Congressman Mike Johnson, now Speaker Johnson, to, to kind of show a contrast. Uh, clip number 13. I will conclude with this. The job of the Speaker of the House is to serve the whole body, and I will. But I've made a commitment to my colleagues here that this speaker's office is going to be known for decentralizing the power here. My office is going to be known for members being more involved and having more influence in our processes and all the major decisions that are made here for predictable processes and regular order. We owe that to the people. 
a unifying message. Now, he did not compromise on any principles, but he wasn't, uh, you know, he, he wasn't trying to pick a fight. In fact, here's my prediction. Not only will uh, Speaker Johnson be able to unify the Republicans, but I think what you're going to see is it's, he's going to make it difficult for, not, not, not all, some, they just can't help themselves. But I actually think you're going to see some Democrats join in some of these efforts to advance common sense, practical legislation. And I think it's going to happen because he's going to, he's going to put it in such a way that they're, it's going to be hard for them not to. So it's, it's going to be, uh, it, it's, I'm telling you, it is a, uh, is, is a new day. Now, he did um, put a few folks on notice as uh, he was talking, as he came to the conclusion of his remarks. So I got a couple more uh, clips I want to play. Let's play clip number 11. Last thing I'm going to say is a message to the rest of the world. They have been watching this drama play out for a few weeks. We've learned a lot of lessons, but you know what? Through adversity, it makes you stronger. And yeah. And, and we want our allies around the world to know that this body of lawmakers is reporting again to our duty stations. Let the enemies of freedom around the world hear us loud and clear. The people's house is back in business. That was a, a very clear message that those who are have taken advantage, and we've talked about this on the program. I think that it, while it wasn't the trigger, I, I do think it had something to do with the timing of what happened in Israel with Hamas uh, and, and Iran, Iran pushing forward. Um, so I, I think this sends a message. In fact, uh, we have Chuck Holton joining us now live from Israel, and I, I wanted to see if he's gotten a response to uh, the developments here in the United States. Uh, Chuck, thanks so much for joining us. I know it's late, late over there in uh, Israel. Thanks so much for uh, joining us this evening. Sure thing, Tony. So the, uh, the House now has a speaker, a, a solid speaker, and uh, one of his final statements was to put our enemies on notice. Uh, any response there in Israel that the, the United States, the Congress, is getting its uh, house in order? You know, this this just happened, uh, and so I don't think anybody over here is really even tracking that at this point. Uh, I don't think anybody here really cares. What they're they're more worried about is when is this ground operation going to start, and uh, the the uh, complexities and intricacies of American politics just don't even register for for most people here. Well, from a standpoint of the support that's going to be, in fact, the first order of business was a resolution of support. And so soon we'll be seeing mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the material that in the the financial support that Israel is looking for. But give us an update. I know there's there's been some frustration that the ground operation has and has not begun. What what's happening there on the ground? Yeah, I spent the day out with some special forces troops from the IDF, and they are training and training and training and overtraining. And they say that they feel like a bunch of meat eaters that are being fed a steady diet of cabbage at this point. Uh, but they realize that the politicians are the ones that are going to have the say in this. And they are just worried that the politicians are going to end up snatching defeat from the jaws of victory as they are wont to do. Uh, but in this, in this case, uh, there is one very interesting tidbit that I heard today from them uh, as they sort of speculated on why this operation would have been delayed so long. And one of the ideas they came up with is that uh, since Hamas needs diesel fuel to run the generators that pump air into these tunnels, the 300 miles of tunnels underneath Gaza, uh, they're sort of waiting for them to run out of fuel for the generators so that those tunnels will quickly become uninhabitable and the, that'll force the mm. Hamas operatives to the surface. Uh, so. Chuck, we're, we're up against a, a break. We've got to go to a short break. Can you stick with us? Sure. All right, we're going to go to a quick break. We're going to come back. And, uh, you know, I want to probe a little deeper on that. Is this a decision being driven strictly by the political ramifications or is there military concerns here as well? So don't go away, folks. We're coming back more with Chuck Holden right after this.
All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. Leah Sherabu, a Christian teenager in Nigeria, remains a captive of Boko Haram for her refusal to renounce her Christian faith. Chinese pastor Wang Yi is serving a nine-year sentence for speaking publicly against the Chinese government. In Pakistan, Asif Purvez is on death row for allegedly sending a blasphemous text message. All of this because people in power decided different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us on the website, TonyPerkins.com. All right, joining us uh, from the front lines in Israel is freelance war reporter Chuck Holton. Chuck, thanks so much for uh, sticking around and for joining us tonight. So the, as you said, you were out to, with the military today and they think the, the, it's the politicians, but is there uh, still some aspect of trying to identify where the hostages may be? Could that be delaying the ground operation? I think that's a very reasonable assumption. There are several factors that have come up over and over again as people have speculated on the, why uh, Israel has not gone ahead with this operation. Because, uh, number one, uh, they are um, talking with uh, Qatar and Egypt and a little bit with the United States about these hostages uh, and trying to get more of them released. The, the reality is that these guys go in on this ground operation. The chances of actually rescuing those hostages is very, very low. They still don't even know how many hostages they have. There, there are several hundred people that are still missing that they haven't been able to either identify as dead or taken yet. And so they're trying to work that all out. Uh, so that that's one consideration. The other one is the fuel consideration. We've seen this uh, trickle of aid coming in across the border. Uh, at the Rafa Gate in, um, from Egypt. But none of that aid has been fuel, and there's a reason for that, because uh, Hamas needs that fuel to run the fans that will pump air into those tunnels, and if they don't have it, then those tunnels quickly become unusable. Uh, so that's, that's another reason right there. Uh, uh, another reason is what the United States is saying, that they need more time to get air defense capability up and running across the Middle East to protect American troops, because they know that as soon as this, uh, or they believe that as soon as this uh, operation takes place, that there are going to be attacks on American infrastructure, American military, all across uh, the United, uh, all across the, the whole continent, uh, the whole world even. And so they want, they're getting prepared. They've already seen 24 troops that have been injured in the last several days by attacks on bases in Iraq, and so they're very concerned about that. Uh, they are also ramping up because uh, they're saying that they have to have a plan in place to evacuate up to 600,000 American citizens who are in Israel at this point, uh, the, the, and, and that would be a absolutely massive undertaking. Uh, that all of a sudden the United States is sort of getting a little worried about because uh, that would kind of be a last resort. It's it's highly unlikely that 
uh, Israel's going to get overrun here. But in the case that something like that did happen, they'd have to answer that question, what do you do with all those American uh, American citizens? So, Chuck, what's the sense now? Uh, Iran threatened, you know, preemptive actions if they go into Gaza, you know, a week or so ago. Is there a sense that Iran will escalate? I mean, we've got Hezbollah up in the, in the north. I mean, what's the situation been there? We're continuing to see rocket attacks? In the north, we certainly are. Hezbollah has been making incursion attempts, rocket attacks, mortar attacks, machine gun and sniper attacks. Uh, they've been shooting towers with the uh, uh, ATGM rockets they've got. Uh, you know, people forget that there's still 10,000 UN troops up there uh, in just across the border in, in Lebanon that are supposed to be there as a peacekeeping force. I'm not sure what they actually do, but they're not keeping the peace, that's for sure. Uh, Israel has evacuated everybody from within, within about five kilometers of the northern border and the southern border. And uh, so that's almost a quarter million people that have been displaced now within Israel because of this fighting. And uh, so Nobody really knows, but talking with the troops here today, they really don't feel like uh, Iran is actually going to get directly involved. Uh, they feel like Hamas is sort of expendable to all to everybody. Uh, they they give them some money. You guys go and harass uh, Israel, but uh, they don't feel like Iran because there's just too. Iran has far too much to lose, and after all, Israel does have 80-something nuclear warheads, so there's that. Is there still the sense, uh, last week we, we spoke, that uh, Gaza was going to be cleaned out? Uh, Israel was not going not gonna to tolerate this continual harassment. Is that still the sense? That is still the sense. I mean, you can hear the jets maybe going over right now. Uh, they have been constantly pounding Gaza, no, the northern part of Gaza, for almost three weeks now. And they, they've they reduced much of Gaza City to rubble. Uh, there, there really won't be a whole lot left when Israel gets done with the northern part of Gaza, at least. And they don't, uh, from what I'm told, from what the government is saying, they have no plans to occupy it or stay there. Uh, and I think maybe that's part of the reason why they're delaying as well, is that uh, in, in, from a standing start three weeks ago, two, two and a half weeks ago, they've now got to come up with an operation that, that encompasses half a million troops. That's massive. And they've got to figure out what are the objectives here and, and what does winning look like and what's our end point? How do we know when, it's, when we're done and it's time to leave? Mm. All right, Chuck Holton, uh, always great to see you, praying for your safety and well-being, and we certainly appreciate you uh, joining us and keeping us up to date on what's happening in Israel. My pleasure. All right, Chuck Holton, freelance war correspondent. Um, yeah, really, be, be praying for all those folks over there, but we're grateful to have people on the ground that can uh, keep us updated. All right, when we come back, we're going to be looking at the United Nations. He was just talking about how they weren't keeping the peace in Lebanon. Well. Secretary General basically spouting off in uh, what I would say maybe anti-Semitic comments. I don't know. We're going to talk about it next. Congressman Mike Waltz joins us after the break. Don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead. The world is hurting. Streets are filled with crime. Families are broken, sin is celebrated, and God is mocked. Everywhere we look, the wages of our sin are on full display. As Christians, we know that surrender to God's will is the solution to our biggest problems, but not everyone agrees. Even in church, we hear people say the most important thing is to be tolerant, that we shouldn't impose a morality on other people, and that loving our neighbor means celebrating what they do. But you can't do that. It's not that you don't love your neighbor, you do. But you care about God's opinion more than your neighbor's opinion, and this makes you different. In fact, sometimes it makes you feel alone, like you are the only one. But there is good news. You are not alone, not even close. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, 
deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, go to frc.org slash sage con and take the quiz to find out. The world is hurting and we have the solution. We can't do it alone, but we can do it if we work together. That's what we're working toward every day. Join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, SageCon, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, SageCon, to learn more. I'm often asked by people, Tony, how do you stay encouraged? How do you deal with all of the stuff in Washington, D.C., the negative policies that are attacking our faith, our family, and our freedoms? Well, you want me to let you in on the secret? It's called the Word of God. And that is why the Family Research Council embarked on Stand on the Word, a two-year journey through the Bible. It's a chronological Bible reading plan with just 10 to 15 minutes a day. In two years, you will have covered the entire Bible. And to go along with this, Monday through Friday, I do a morning devotional that goes along with the reading of the day. It's all designed to encourage you on this journey because the Word of God, as the psalmist said, in my affliction, here's my comfort, your Word gives me life. That is our source of strength. To find out more, go to TonyPerkins.com or FRC.org slash Bible. And I invite you to join me every morning for our Stand on the Word Bible devotion. FRC, celebrating 40 years with Congressman Mike Johnson. We just want to say to the staff and everyone who works in and around FRC, keep doing what you do. It's, it's an invaluable resource to us on Capitol Hill and, and, and to many of us, more than you know, individually and personally. Um, so it's a comfort to us to know that you're in the battle. We're all in it together, and uh, we're really, really grateful you're there. And, of course, is now Speaker Mike Johnson. Um, as I said, excited about the, uh, the way forward as uh, we now have a speaker after 22 days, and it could not have come, uh, well, couldn't come at a more appropriate time as uh, outrage erupted at the United Nations yesterday after U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres implied that Israel provoked the brutal terrorist invasion of Hamas, which included the murder of women, children, and the elderly. Guterres attempted to walk back those comments after Israeli officials called for the U.N. chief's resignation and questioned the legitimacy of the organization he leads. Now, while the United States stands behind Israel as a stalwart ally, what do the U.N. leaders' comments reflect about the support from the international bureaucracy, which we are funding? Joining me now to discuss this is Congressman Mike Waltz of Florida. He's a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman Waltz, welcome back to uh, the program. Good to see you. Hey, good to be with you. And, uh, and what a great day for, uh, for Christians around the world and for the Family Research Council to get uh, Speaker Mike Johnson. Uh, I think he's going to be a, a, a great leader for the House, he's, as, as we saw today, unifying the Republican conference moving forward, uh, and of course you've worked with him on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, you, you know the quality gentleman that he is, and so I'm, I'm excited for, for all of you there in the House that we're going to see some good things happen. It's time to get back to work, it, Tony. It, you, you, uh, <laughs> this, our adversaries around the world smell weakness in, White House, in the White House, and the only entity in Washington pushing uh, the Biden administration to do the right thing, whether it's on the border or with Iran, and then and stopping bad policy uh, everywhere we can for House Republicans. So uh, it was a phenomenally frustrating three weeks. I'm not sure. Uh, well, let's just move forward. Well, I want to play a clip because I want to get a response to you from the U.N. Secretary General. Play clip number six. 
the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence, their economy stifled, their people displaced, and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to their plight have been vanishing. Now, Congressman, he's tried to walk those back today, but he said the same thing almost identically on October the 8th. I mean, what does this tell us about the United Nations? Well, he's just saying the quiet part out loud, and they're showing their true colors. Uh, this is why uh, we in the House have voted to defund huge portions of the UN. Uh, you rightly point out that we cover about a quarter of their entire budget, but specific agencies, you know, like the H UN Human Rights Organization that has, you know, China and Cuba sitting on it, or UNESCO, which a lot of people think, you know, heck, that's just kind of preserving historic sites around the world. Yes, but they also teach blatantly anti-Semitic teachings uh, through a number of its courses. So we've just got to take uh, an ax to our funding of the UN. It has gone way off the rails uh, from its original intention. And oh, by the way, when you have a Security Council member in Russia uh, invading its neighbors, uh, we didn't hear too many harsh words from the UN General Secretary then. And I wonder if, you know, in the back of his mind, does he think, the United States provoked 9-11 uh, because what he said uh, is just may as well have been written by Osama bin Laden or the leaders of Hamas or Mugni and Hezbollah or, or some other extremist organization. It's just ridiculous and he should resign. Yeah, it, 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 and we shouldn't be funding this organization. In fact, I just had uh, Chuck Holton, war correspondent, on from Israel, and he was talking about what's happening in the north uh, on the north bo northern border of Israel, and the the UN peacekeeping troops there in Lebanon are doing absolutely nothing to keep the peace up there. I mean, what's the point? No, not only not only are they not keeping the peace, they often turn a blind eye uh, to what uh, Hezbollah is up to up there. But yeah, there's been U.S. Uh, UN excuse me peacekeepers sitting there. There's still UN peacekeepers sitting in the Sinai. Uh, so I. <laughs> You're absolutely right, uh, and House Republicans are moving uh, are moving to defund it. So let's talk about what happened on the floor today. Um, first, uh, first order of business was to express support for Israel. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We got back to work, and the first thing we did uh, was uh, put a, a resolution on the floor uh, expressing uh, support for Israel. Um, but I'm going to continue to call uh, my Democrat colleagues to the carpet and call them out because behind all of this is uh, Iran. It's easy to say we support Israel, uh, but the reality is, as long as uh, as long as Gaza, as uh, excuse me, as long as Hamas in Gaza, as long as uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the militias in Iraq are receiving the funding, the ammunition. The training, the Wall Street Journal is now reporting uh, that 500 elite Palestinian mini, uh, militants trained directly in Iran. As long as the head of the snake is has its coffers full, uh, which they do, only under this administration, they did not under President Trump's maximum pressure, then this is, uh, this is going to keep happening. We have to deal with Iran. This administration has an Iran problem that they don't want to admit. And that's why you're seeing this kind of equivocating, everything from our bases that are being hit to whether the intelligence show that they were directly involved to whether they were absolutely wrong on the Iran deal uh, that uh, and on the sanctions they're ignoring that has Iran flush with cash. I mean, it, it makes no sense at all. We're funding our enemy to attack our allies, and then we're giving money to our allies to fight off the enemy that we funded. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Tony. And, and to take it a step further, it really is this administration's failed energy policy. We should be flooding global markets with American clean energy uh, that, that comes, uh, that we are blessed to have, that drives down the price of oil and gas, uh, that takes cash out of the coffers of Putin and takes cash out of the coffers of the Ayatollah. Every time they've gotten aggressive, 
like this and started invading neighbors or uh, funding their proxies, uh, it's been when the price of, of oil gets near $100 a barrel. Uh, and so it is, it, it's, it's all tied into this green obsession that they right. have uh, that is actually indirectly making our adversaries rich and then we're spending against ourselves. It is just completely, uh, you just couldn't make this up except um, that this is exactly what the administration's doing. I mean, it's really not complex. It, it really is pretty simple. You just go back to the basics, but they've, you're, yeah, oh, it is It is frustrating and it is, uh, it, it's troubling and it's extremely dangerous. Congressman Mike Waltz, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for taking time to join us this afternoon. Will do, Tony. This is why we got to get back to work. Thanks Absolutely. so much. God bless. All right. Congressman Mike Waltz of Florida. Now joining us now is uh, the co-chair of the Israel Allies Caucus, also uh, chairman of the Pro-Life Caucus in the House, New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith. Chris, welcome to uh, the program. Good Thank to see you. you. Good to see you as always, Tony. Thank you. And uh, Congressman Smith, also a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. So I want to talk Israel. But first, sure. I, I want to get your reaction to uh, the House unanimously electing Mike Johnson as speaker today. Sure. Every Republican rallied around uh, Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson is an absolutely class individual, uh, full of love of Jesus, love of God. Uh, and he is a very, very effective scholar. You know, he's a constitutional lawyer. He understands uh, how law is made. And he, he's, a, he's a practitioner of, of, of um, uh, all of this in, in a way that's going to substantially boost us and help uh, us get our agenda forward. He's got such a nice way about him. He radiates the love of Christ. Uh, and he does it so effectively. And he'll take a lot of barbs. He already t has taken some from the Democrats. But uh, he'll return uh, fire, but he'll do so in a very ethical way. So I, I couldn't be happier. He's an amazing guy. And, and you're going to have a great ally uh, as chairman of the Pro-Life Caucus. Uh, Without a doubt. I mean, he's strong. Uh, Mike and I have worked on some pro-life stuff going all the way back I when I have. was in the Louisiana legislature. So let's talk Israel today, a resolution, one of the first orders of business, business uh, as, the, as the House got back to business, was a resolution for the support of Israel. We're just talking with Mike Waltz about that. Why is this significant at this time? Well, it was significant to have everybody, and it was bipartisan, as you pointed out. There were 425 co-sponsors, which never happens uh, on any piece of legislation. Out of 435, that's amazing. Uh, but it, it, it sent a very clear message of our solidarity with Israel, as well as our pro profound opposition to Hamas and their use of torture, their use of uh, rape and, and all the terrorism tactics that they have uh, deployed against Israelis, including Americans, uh, Jewish Americans who are there. Many have died as well. Uh, and, you know, it, it, Hamas really, and I've been saying this for years, I just had another hearing on it last June uh, uh, and, um, uh, and talked a lot about how anti-Semitism is at the core. They teach it, as you know. Uh, Tony, in UNRWA, which is UN Works Relief Agency, we fund that. Uh, you know, uh, Trump had stopped it all completely. Uh, and now under Biden, we're, we provided uh, about a billion dollars uh, to these schools, <clears throat> which, which just promote anti-Semitism 24-7. And uh, it's in the textbooks. It's, uh, uh, so the culture of hate is promulgated every single day and taught to the next generation. And the generation that's doing the killing now has already been in those UNRWA camps as well as those schools. I have another hearing, Tony, set for uh, November 8th on the United Nations, and their very biased and anti-Semitic activities, whether it be UNRWA, the UN Human Rights Council, and now most recently, uh, Secretary uh, General Gutierrez, who said some very, very terrible things about, right. uh, about Israel and so-called occupation. Yeah, we played that, uh, we played that we earlier. Did. But I, I yeah. want to play a clip of, of actually President Biden from earlier today because his comments are not very helpful either. Uh, play clip number uh, two, please. There's no going back to the status quo as it stood on October the 6th. That means ensuring Hamas can no longer terrorize Israel and use Palestinian civilians as human shields. It also means that when this crisis is over, there has to be a vision of what comes next. And in our view, it has to be a two-state solution. I, I mean, th this two-state solution idea, th this is what brought us to, to Gaza. 
and turning yeah. control of Gaza over to Hamas. I mean, what did they not get about this? Tony, excellent point. The test case of the two-state solution was Gaza. You know, the Israelis turned it over in a uh, in exchange for peace, and they got have got nothing from it except terrorism and war. Uh, if there's an additional two-state, in other words, the West Bank and other parts uh, go over to as a state to uh, the Palestinians, we'll have uh, you know it, it, the proximity to Jerusalem and elsewhere will even be higher and greater, uh, and the threat will be very, very profound. So I, uh, uh, a two-state solution, it's been tried, it's been tested, and it's an utter failure. And I would argue, as you just pointed out, that's how we got to this point of this. It is. The, the, the agreement. The, the, exactly. the worst act of aggression, brutality since the Holocaust toward the Jewish people yeah. happened as a result of those that have been pushing policies in pursuit of this two-state solution. Exactly. I've read the Hamas 1988, um, uh, their, their manifesto, and I quoted it on, during the floor debate today on the floor. Uh, they want Israel to be wiped off the map, all Jews killed. They call for the killing of all the Jews. And, and they say it very matter-of-factly uh, in their document. And, and they're doing it. You know, if Israel was not re resolute and had the iron will to push back, um, they would be right. wiped off the face so, of the uh, earth. And I, I can't believe the naivete of saying, let's go back to a flawed uh, 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 vision right. of the two state uh, solution. We're almost out of time, Chris, but I, I just want to ask you this question, and it's rhetorical. But when are we going to start believing what these people say? I mean, this goes all the way back to Adolf Hitler. That nobody wanted to believe what he was saying. I mean, this they're doing exactly what they said they were going to do. You know, absolutely true. And even when they talk about peace conferences and the like, the Hamas Charter in 1988 makes very clear and their reiteration of it uh, in 2017 that there is no Israel. It right. will be done away with. So they're saying it. They say it again. It, they act on it. They kill people, innocent people. And, and, the, and, and we're supposed, yeah. In their textbooks, their maps oh. don't even include Israel. I, I've seen the textbook. I've seen the I maps. Have too. There's no more Israel. And, and that's what my hearing will be focusing on. Uh, another hearing on combating anti-Semitism, of course, with a special focus on the UN. And it's very, very aggressively bigoted view uh, in all of its manifestations towards the state of Israel. Well, thank you for shining a light on that. It needs to be done. Chris Smith, always great to see you. You do a great job for us on Capitol Hill, and we're grateful for you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for all your wonderful work. Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey, chair of the Pro-Life uh, Pro Caucus, as well as co-chair of the Israel Allies Caucus. All right, folks, uh, if you'd like to join the effort to pray for the speaker in the House of Representatives, text the word speaker to 67742, 67742. Pray with us for the next 21 days. This could be a sea change for America. Until next time, I leave you once again with the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul, who says when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you've taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.